thank you so much for coming. <laughs> I'm uh, Julia and welcome everyone. I am the current artist and curator of the Art of Science program at the Carl R. Woese Institute for Genomic Biology. Our Interdisciplinary Science Institute not only supports genomic research, but we also work to communicate research uh, to the public. Um, so I would like you, will you please introduce yourself and tell us a little about what you do? Yeah, thank you for uh, asking me to come over. Uh, I'm Tahir Saif. I'm a professor of mechanical science and engineering. Uh, and uh, my research is um, quite diverse. Um, I look at neuroscience. Um, I, I study cancer evolution um, and as well as materials at small scale. Um, but the work that I was doing uh, during the last um, February, March, April last year, when there was a lot of um, questions about masks, and we thought we uh, spent some time um, in the lab when labs were all closed, mm -hmm. and so IGB opened up their doors for me, uh, and we did a lot of work in IGB to study how masks would help um, and how um, you know, what are the benefits of using just a common cloth mask. Uh, and we worked with CDC <clears throat> quite extensively. We gave the data as we were collecting them. And um, soon after, as we were updating our data, CDC came up with the cloth mask as a double layer cloth mask or cloth covering, they said, uh, to prevent the, uh, the dissemination of the disease. And so here we are. Uh, when mask was, oh, you don't need mask to now mask is mandatory in many places. Mm. So that's sort of my background. Wonderful, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so will you tell me, uh, just sort of describe what is featured in uh, the original scientific images that you shared? Yeah, so uh, we wanted to find out that when um, a COVID infected individual sneezes, talks and, and coughs, you know, how normal cloths from your home uh, could protect the dissemination of the disease. So when we talk and, and sneeze and cough, we have these little droplets that are coming out. Some are very small, we cannot see by naked eye to some slightly larger. And the question is, you know, would, would cloth be sufficient? Because they come up with high velocity. It's like tiny bullets coming towards the cloth that we are putting on top, on our mouth. And so, so then that's what we tested them by using small droplets using an inhaler. So when you mm. puff an inhaler, it shoots out the medicine, but here we replace the medicine with water and 100 nanometer size particles. Mm. They are fluorescently labeled. So uh, once they come up, come out and hits the cloth, uh, the cloth protects them, protects the droplets or holds the droplets back, but some of them go through. Mm -hmm. So we measured you know, the ones that had gone through versus ones that are trapped by the cloth. And we defined the efficiency of the cloth covering. And by checking with common about 11 household cloths, we found that just using a t-shirt with, with two layers, you know, holds about 95% of the droplets that are coming out. Now, we had to look at each individual nanoparticles, 100 nanometers in size, which is the same size or slightly smaller than the COVID virus size, which is about 120 to 140 nanometers. So we didn't use the COVID virus, which we cannot, uh, at Illinois, but we used these 100 nanometer particles to mimic at least similar size scale. And IGB has uh, the state of the uh, state of the art equipment uh, to visualize single particles. Mm -hmm. So that's how we visualize the single particles, or we visualized the little droplets that are carrying the little particles using this high resolution imaging, which on one hand uh, brings to life what would be happening when somebody is talking or sneezing uh, versus what it means to be breathing air, which is free from those particles. And as you mentioned, the whole idea of mask was you know, how much can we breathe through and yet how much can we prevent those particles from coming in? So there was a trade-off 
between the two. Mm. And I felt that um, in, a, in a deep sense, um, if you think about air, which I really loved the title uh, in your artwork or the them thematic sense, that it's a trade-off that we have come to choose, you know, as we progressed through the COVID, it told us that you know, we, by wearing the mask, we cannot breathe as easily as without the mask. But without the mask, we'll be breathing in particles that would kill us. With the mask, we're giving up something. But it also tells us how important the air is, how important its cleanliness is. And we may not recognize in everyday life. Uh, but I think through artwork, um, it kind of showed uh, you know, how, how it relates to life. Um, so that's sort of my perspective on it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, as we sort of spoke of, I, I built the piece um, as if there were sort of two diaphragms mm -hmm. um, sort of breathing at each other as this sort of idea that um, whether or not we sort of feel it in an everyday sense, we share our air um, all around us and sort of getting a feel for what what that kind of looked like in an abstract sense to sort of say mm -hmm. like, oh, the, the air that I'm breathing is not just like my air. <laughs> we're, we're all breathing the same air um, yeah. in, our, uh, in, our, in our planet. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could say something about how science imagery influences your research. So the sort of act of using images um, in science. Yeah, it's a very, very important question. We don't usually think in that way, but deep in the subconscious mind, the scientists are artists mm. because we always imagine a world that we have not seen it yet. We always imagine Mm -hmm. that maybe this is what is happening in subatomic particles, or this is, might be happening when the disease is spreading. So scientists always imagine that's what we call hypothesis, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's not a very artistic word. Hypothesis always has a scientific connotation, but it's, it's an imagination, it's an artwork mm -hmm. that we envision, we imagine. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a scientist might be working on a white piece of paper by drawing sketches and thinking that this is how a phenomena is evolving, mm. then go to the lab and then see, does it really happen? Mm. And if it doesn't happen, maybe the reality and the imagination had some mismatch, but that's okay. But the science always starts by this deep sense of imagination, mm. deep sense of art. So in that way, artists and scientists are not different <laughs> it's, I think, as Einstein said that, you know, the imagination is better than knowledge because imagination has no boundaries or no bounds, but knowledge has. Uh, science cannot go too far without the sense of imagination, which to me is the other name for art. Mm -hmm. So they go hand in hand. So yeah, it inspires me because I always imagine what I might be seeing in the lab, what might be happening because of when you put A and B together. Mm. Uh, and once I imagine, then I have an artwork in my mind, what I should be looking for. So if I don't see that, then I create a new art in my mind. Maybe the one that I imagine had something missing in it. Mm. So I create a new art in the minds of the scientists, right? And then eventually we come to a compromise between the reality and the art. Um, so that's what I think inspires every single scientist as it does the, you know, a four-year-old kid. I, I, I love it. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, I feel like um, this is the thing that often, you know, it's so important to, get specialty to learn very specific things. I, yeah. you know, we separate ourselves so we can get really, really strong knowledge about one thing. Uh, yeah. But this is the sort of process that's so interesting to me that when we do collaborative work in a, in a big way, what is it, 
yeah, what, what does it mean for us to share our processes and idea and then sort of being able to exactly share that very essential thought about imagination mm -hmm. um, is what drives us in, yeah. in whatever sort of field we are to imagine something different or to imagine what something could be or imagine what might be happening. Um, yeah, I really, I really appreciate that description. Um, I, I spent some time sort of using these gradations of the sky in your image to kind mm -hmm. of build this, this airy feel. So instead of using um, uh, uh, um, programmatic gradations, mm -hmm. um, like you can sort of in Photoshop, I used um, just photos of the sky <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because of the way the light sort of builds that soft um, mm -hmm. gradation, yeah. so sort of bringing in that kind of, um, data in my own way, <laughs> bringing in the like more specific um, uh, structured information to build that sort of visually. So I think there are ways in which artists as well sort of like have scientific processes or more um, structured processes that they bring into their imagine imaginative okay. process as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you speaking with me today and we're so happy to feature your work and thank you so much for the work that you did, especially uh, during this crazy time in this crazy year. Oh, glad to be here and thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts and portraying the science for people to both understand, reflect. And I think probably that's all uh, that's the biggest contribution that, you know, to art, people can begin to reflect not only just the science, uh, but um, the things that we take it for granted, air, uh, the lack of which or the inability to take it cause many people to die. And many are dying every day. Uh, and yet we don't often realize that how precious this, these resources that, that we have. So I'm glad that you are doing this for the public at large. Thank I'm, you. <laughs> thank you. I'm so glad I could work with your work. Thank you very much. Thank you.